pre-birthday. So I think we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi, and I'm the Children and Teens Event Manager at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this virtual format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of hosting our event this afternoon, and I am beyond delighted to welcome our guests, Julie Andrews and Emma Walton Hamilton. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. You can click the link that we will drop into the chat box to get your own copy of Enchanted Symphony, which is beautiful. We'll talk more about it. And we do have some signed book plates available while supplies last. If you have a question for our guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. We would especially love to hear from the kids in the audience. And uh, just a quick reminder that the chat box has been disabled. Please only use the Q&A section for questions for our authors. At the end of the presentation, our guests will have time to answer some of your favorite questions, and you can also upvote the questions you like and want most answered. So now onto the event that you're waiting for. Julie Andrews has been a cherished star of stage, screen, and TV for more than half a century. Her many beloved roles include characters in Mary Poppins, The Sound of Music, The Princess Diaries, and recently the voice of Lady Whistledown on Bridgerton. Not only a Golden Globe, Emmy, and Oscar winner, Julie Andrews is also a best-selling author. She has dedicated her life to important causes such as Operation USA, an international relief organization, and received her honors as Dame of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on New Year's Eve, 1999. Emma Walton Hamilton is an award-winning writer, producer, and arts educator. She has co-authored more than 30 children's books with her mother, Julie Andrews, eight of which have been on the New York Times bestseller list. She was nominated for two Emmys for the children's TV show, Julie's Green Room, and she is a Grammy award-winning voiceover artist for audiobooks. Yes. She is also, yeah. She is also a faculty member for Stony Brook University, where she serves as director of the Children's Lit Fellows Program and the annual Southampton Children's Literature Conference. Many thanks to both of you for being here and happy book birthday. Thank you. Thank you. We're it is, so happy to celebrate today it. Is it's very first day out on store shelves and everything else. And no better mm -hmm. place to celebrate than with politics and prose. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for so. having us. Thank oh, you. My pleasure. Okay. Pleasure. Um, I do have a selection of questions that I'm going to ask you all, and um, I know that you're going to read a selection of the story to us after that, and then we will have some Q&A. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so my first question is, the story is really a powerful commentary on the power of music, the arts, and enjoying simple pleasures in life. Can you tell us a little bit about the backstory on why, why you decided to write the book? Should I, should I start? Yeah, well, actually, a lot of our books uh, go to the arts, the music, family, nature, nature, children, of course. We, we always, we start writing and then we go, we've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, so, but this one is rather special because one day I was, I can't remember where I was looking in a book or, or a magazine. No, no, you were on YouTube. Was I on YouTube? Mm -hmm. And I happened to see, uh, and I think you, I don't know if you have it to put up on your screen, this phenomenal picture. Oh, here it is. There it is. Of this, uh, what what was it called, darling? It's called the Grand Teatre de Liceu in Barcelona, and it's an opera house. And it was, at, uh, because of COVID, because of the pandemic, no people were going into theatres or cinemas or galleries, theaters, galleries symphonies, anything. So yeah. this very clever artist decided that he'd find an audience and it was nothing but plants. I mean, every seat, every box is filled with plants, every tier of the balconies. Mm. And I was stunned by it. And in fact, on the original tiny, tiny um, blurb about it, they had a, a four piece quartet, did they? Yeah, there is actually a little video uh, that, mm. that you can find online yeah. of this performance where uh, they had a little quartet perform a Puccini piece called Chrysanthemum um, mm -hmm. for this entire audience of plants. And, and we felt or thought when I showed it to Emma that those leaves actually maybe rustled a little <laughs> bit at the end of the performance. And it was yeah. so unusual to see this and mm -hmm. it captured our imagination. And we said there must be a way where we don't dwell on the pandemic. We don't want to be 
uh, we want the book to be timeless if possible. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. didn't want to dwell on that. What kind of a story could we make that would bring this to life in a slightly different format? But it also seemed the perfect for us, the perfect marriage of our two yes, passions. Yeah. You know, because we're so we're such passionate arts advocates and we are also such passionate nature lovers. This image just encapsulated both of those joys in our lives. And, and um, so it was great fun to try to brainstorm a story that that led to this. Hmm. And, and this celebrated is quite stable, things. isn't it? An allegory in a way. It is. Um, yeah. We didn't want to, uh, it's more a what if and more about the, the condition of humanity. Yeah, yeah they will when we read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So um, thank you for sharing that. So even though COVID has, this isn't a book about COVID. And not COVID, at all, no. No, no, it, and not at all. But, you know, I think maybe that time that we spent at home really helped us appreciate the little pleasures in life. So how do you think that we, you know, you refer to the fog in the book, and I'll let you all talk more about that. But how do we keep the fog at bay on a daily basis? Like, what can we do to do? To oh, keep well, the fog sort of speaks to an ennui in general, a loss of of what's real and valuable in life and so I think it's well, for us I can only speak from our point of view it's uh, nature music arts of course home family those, those are the values that we that we cherish and that we celebrate but I think to your question Heidi um, I think what the book is really inviting us to consider is the is the idea or the notion of mindfulness hmm. yeah, what matters most in life and how do we stay mindful to those things how do we grateful. how do we keep them front and center in our minds um and, and no matter what has, is going on in the world really. yeah, yeah it has to do with sort of be, being aware being mindful and keeping dis distractions at bay to the extent yeah. that we can yeah yeah absolutely i think the pandemic did make that very crystal clear what was very important in our lives so absolutely yeah. and we were so because of our love of the arts and our both of us have backgrounds in the arts mm -hmm. we were so aware of how uh you know theaters sat empty cinemas sat mm -hmm. empty concert halls sat empty yeah. and and we were all at home of course like everyone and right. We took extra, we've always taken pleasure in our gardens, but we took extra, extra pleasure and that sort of filled the void for us. Yeah, absolutely. So you referred to this already, but you were talking about how important music and the arts have been to both of your lives. So could you talk maybe a little bit more about that? I, I know that you have both been long in the arts. So maybe give us a little taste about, you know, how that has been a part of your lives. I think it, in any life, and mine's been considerable, and I'm fairly advanced, uh, it's the incredible serendipity that leads from one thing to another. And for me to have been fortunate enough to, my, my main strength was in singing as a child. I was a child entertainer. And of course, my mother was a great pianist and my stepfather, uh, who sort of discovered my singing voice was a fine tenor. But I mean, from, from the early days when I traveled endlessly in vaudeville to the good fortune of going to Broadway, and then the incredible further good fortune of going to Hollywood and making films and singing those beautiful songs, and particularly the words of those songs. What matters to me, mm. uh, uh, lyrics in songs, the words of songs really matter mm. to me. And um, I think probably, well, you know, it's novel. interesting because you you grew up in a house full of music. Yeah, and, and also was... um, I loved to read and write as a child. Yeah, and I think but you I... were surrounded by your mom playing the piano and your stepdad singing and your aunt teaching ballet in the yes, dance studio yes, next yeah. door. So she she grew up, you know, deeply immersed in the arts, and then by extension, so did I. Um, because of course with the nature of her work, I was also surrounded uh, by mm -hmm. music and by- And we read a lot as in, we, you and we I did. wrote together yeah. sometimes as a kid. And, yeah. and my father was also in the theater and designed mm -hmm. uh, sets and costumes for Broadway and things. So. And films, a very fine designer he was. And uh, yeah, so those, those were our foundational influences. I think yeah, it's, I no, think. it's no accident that they continue to be the things- And that the wonder the that joy. those things bring I mean, for me, in terms of the arts, just singing with a large orchestra is one of the loveliest 
things I can imagine. It's, it's magical how you feel when you've got all that beautiful sound around you. And uh, my singing teacher used to tell me, it's a little beside the point here, but she used to say that singing with a beautiful symphony orchestra is like being lifted up in the coziest, most comfortable armchair mm -hmm. and being carried over the heads of the musicians. And that's, she was exactly right. It was a fabulous feeling and it still, you know, thrills me to this day to think about it. I love that beautiful imagery. That's gorgeous. Emma, do you remember um, some of the earliest music that your mom sang to you or books that she read to you? I do. Um, it's funny, people ask me this a lot, you know, did your mom sing to you? Did she mm -hmm. sing all the songs from all the things that yeah. she was in? And did she that. didn't, you know, like yeah. most people, she didn't bring her work home, so to speak. Um, you know, just like most of us at the end of the workday, we kind of want to put that down and, and be uh, in another world, in a family world. But what we did sing a lot together was um, English, uh, English folk songs, folk English songs, English ditties, English campfire songs, those mm -hmm. kinds of yes. more <laughs> songs. <laughs> of songs that you as a child might enjoy. And then songs like "You Are My Sunshine," you know, yes. um, oh. you know those kinds of songs, of course, and things like that. Um, we did a lot of that, and then we read together as a family quite a bit. Um, mm. Mom read. Her favorite book growing up as a as a child, which was a um, pastoral English story called The Little Grey Men mm -hmm. about the last four gnomes in Britain. But um, it's a beautiful, it's a, yes, no, it's a novel of, of great beauty and description. And it's again about nature. Mm -hmm. And then we read The Wind in the Willows yeah. and, uh, you know, lots of and later, later on Watership Down. Watership Down. Yeah. Was oh. kind of course, <laughs> yeah. in, the, um, in the early 70s, when mom started writing her own middle grade novels, mm. um, my my brothers and sisters and I were the, the <laughs> test audience for that. Yes, so, yeah, un, un, unwitting, maybe unwilling people who I, I said, would you do me a favor? Would you like to hear what I just, I just completed this chapter or I just completed that chapter. Yeah. And very bravely, if I felt I had got their attention with what I had been writing, I felt I was on the right track. If they were bored and fidgety and really didn't want to be there, I could tell right away. Of course, kids are so honest and they will they have are, they are. <laughs> tell you how they feel. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. And then we did write years ago when you were little, a very small little book. Yes, we did. the beginning of one of our later books. We wrote a story together when I was about five or six years old that, um, and my, my parents were, had separated and were living on opposite coasts, but we're still great friends. You've always and been my mom had the idea that she and I would write a story together and then my father could illustrate it and I would have a sense of, of family. The benefit of the two you know. things, yeah. And that little story later became one of our children's books. So yes, um, the Simeon's Gifts. Gifts. That's right. Gifts. How did you yeah. know that, Heidi? <laughs> a little homework. <laughs> What's so sweet though is when I when we wrote it together, it was about a I think set in Europe or something, yeah. but you insisted that that Simeon be called Charlie the Englishman. I remember <laughs> that. <Yes. laughs> yeah, we, Different we went, time. Yeah, we went along with it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, I do have to ask, you know, as I was thinking about kind of questions I would ask you and just what questions could I, you know, might you not have heard before, but um, do you have a favorite, because you talk about the power of words and language, do you have a favorite sound that is, that do you just love? Oh my God. God, what a great question. That's a phenomenal question. Well, I think I saw, said it by you know, the sound of any wonderful orchestra, of course, mm. beautiful piece of music. And I'm, ve I'm very fond of all the um, um, uh, romance musicians like Ravel and, and um, oh, I, I won't go into all of them right now. Debussy yeah. mm. and Prokofiev and Tchaikovsky. And I love to go to the ballet, uh, but sounds, well, anything from birdsong and guessing what it is to ocean waves. Yeah, and just, children's got, laughter. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've got trees in my garden that make the most wonderful sighing sound if it's a rather mm. windy day and so on. Children's laughter and rain on the roof is a great sound too. Mm. Then we cool. both love our animals, don't we? Yeah, our, our, our dogs. dogs. Our dogs, yeah. yeah. Talk about little pleasures. I mean, that's yes, just the most exactly. important but they're huge, and, and absolutely constant, and that's what's so lovely. They make a life rich. Oh, yes, indeed.
Um, so to talk a little bit about your collaboration, I know that you all have written over 30 books together, you've worked in the theater together. Could you maybe talk a little bit about what it's like to work together? So Emma, do you want to start what it's what's it like to work with your mom? Sure. Um, well, it, we 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 had worked together in different creative capacities before we started writing together. We had acted together. Yeah. Um, we had uh, mom made her directorial debut at the theater that my husband and I started. We had been, and of course we'd written stories together when I was little. Mm -hmm. So we had that foundation, I, I think. But I don't think we knew if we'd be compatible in a, in a right. real professional way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the happy discovery was that we have different strengths and complementary mm -hmm. strengths, yeah. which we didn't realize until a certain way in. And so generally speaking, the way we work is um, we'll, we'll brainstorm the idea first. We tend to be outliners rather than mm -hmm. Pantsers, as right, right. In the industry. Planners, yeah. Uh, yeah, planners. We we outline as much because we like to have a map and know where we're going, and we like to be thinking about the theme that we're writing yeah. towards. Well, also our different strengths are that you are the real nuts and bolts of all our books. structure. I'm the structure, mm -hmm. first okay. act, second act, third act, that kind of thing, and I'm more all the flights of fancy and the opening sequence or the closing or the, or the interesting character or, or the end of a chapter and then between us we invent a wonderful you know, well let's turn left here let's not just do that and be too yeah. on the nose and so on so and then we we literally it's a function of writing out loud we sit mm. uh, ideally now these days in the same room when we started years ago my mom was based in los angeles mm. and i was on the east coast so <laughs> it was all on the phone and we had terrible wow. next <laughs> wow um, but uh, but now we're in the same space most of the time and um, and we just start brainstorming and writing and thinking out loud and we finish each other. You take it all down. And I'm the scribe. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm at the computer and, and transcribing everything we, we and then I'm very bossy and say, no, 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 not that word. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and, um, and end this perhaps, a tea. lot of tea uh, hence my tea of course. Here, folks. Yeah. absolutely <laughs> yes <laughs> of course I'd expect nothing less and then, and and then a lot of editing yeah a lot and then it's all about revision and the mm. joy of a really great editor mm. and illustrator really, finding it an illustrator and then an illustrator oh. is worthy of the, well seems deals to us worthy of our little book and we have been unbelievably so lucky. Well, I think our first books, we started with your dad, which we did. was a good beginning. But then, of course, life went on and, and different stories require a different style of, of um, uh, Which artists. is a good, I think, and we must talk about our amazing illustrator for this book. Eve, yes. So um, she, her name is Ellie McKay, and she is simply magical in mm. her work. And we fell in love with her uh, style because of its luminous qualities. We didn't know though, did we? We didn't we know it. I mean, we, yeah. what we loved, we knew that because of this, as, as our listeners will hear when we read from the book, because one of the main characters in the book is this fog that pervades the village, we knew that the illustrator had to be somebody who could, who had a translucence to their mm. work and who could capture imagery with a fog overlay mm. and still have it be interesting and colorful and have depth and so forth and um and ellie does that really explain how she puts it together though. but this this was the happy discovery when we we were looking at her work and thinking wow she's magical we might you know this is the kind of thing we really need for this book and then we discovered that what she does is she builds sets of her illustration Ooh. so she makes these 3d cut out versions mm -hmm. of all the, the buildings and, and the, the characters, characters and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then she builds she sets them up like a set and she lights them like a set they and do those. they do yeah glow, don't they? they do and then she photographs them and so what we are seeing in these illustrations is mm -hmm. a photograph of the set of the three-dimensional set that but, she but it makes the main characters because she, they're cutouts that she's mm -hmm. painted and photographed makes them stand out like you don't believe her uh, her instagram <laughs> handle is theater clouds which was just the perfect, you know, the perfect thing for this book. And but we hoped we would get her and she lives in Canada and we were very fortunate in that she did like the work and said she'd love to join us. So we oh, got, and we've had lovely correspondence, haven't we? Yeah. We meet such lovely people. I bet. It's a well, wonderful world. 
I would love for our audience to be able to see some of this. So do you want to do some reading from the book? Let's do. Okay. No, I think you're going to bring up a, yep. a sample of the illustrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a, you can see the characters in the foreground are so much more, of course, in the foreground. But that's and the quality of light and so forth. So yeah. this is uh, this is the Enchanted Symphony by Julie Andrews, Emma Walton Hamilton, and illustrated by Ellie McKay. And I'll start, and then Emma will take a page, and so on. Great. So here we go. <clears throat> Piccolino lived in a small village famous for its charms. Its people were happy and creative. Singing and dancing felt as natural to them as breathing. They cherished their families, their friendships, and the abundant green countryside around them. And they delighted in their exquisite opera house, where Piccolino's father was the maestro of the orchestra. Visitors came from miles around to enjoy the village's delights. To keep the sightseers happy, the townspeople built more shops to sell trinkets, gadgets, and souvenirs. They baked sumptuous cookies and cakes and planted bigger and more colorful window boxes. But the busier and more prosperous they became, the more they lost touch with their own simple pleasures. One day, Piccolino noticed a faint purple mist creeping into the village. At first, everyone was far too busy to be concerned, but soon it thickened and spread from home to home, garden to garden. It crept into cottages and shops, seeping through windows and under doors, until eventually the entire village was blanketed in fog. Trees and flowers began to wilt. Birds no longer sang, and the sun, moon, and stars disappeared from view. People grew listless and dispirited. They stopped visiting with one another or even going outside, and the town fell silent. The opera house sat empty but for Piccolino and his father, who summoned the energy each week to clean the pretty auditorium, lest the fog damage the velvet seats and curtains. They dusted the gold trimmed balconies and crystal chandeliers, and they watered the drooping palms in the lobby, though it didn't seem to help. One day, as the maestro was sweeping the stage, Piccolino wandered over to the grand piano. Gently raising the lid, he played a simple melody that echoed in the empty space. The sound was startling and sweet, and the maestro paused to listen. For a moment, his spirits lifted, and he realized how much he had missed music. But without an audience, the orchestra had no reason to play. As the boy and his father prepared to close up for the day, Piccolino noticed something surprising. The palms in the lobby seemed to be standing taller. On a hunch, he ran back to the piano and played his little tune again. And sure enough, the palms looked fresher still. Piccolino called to his father to come see what had happened. The maestro scratched his chin for a moment and then at Piccolino's urging, he agreed to try an experiment. Returning home, they loaded their ailing houseplants onto a wagon and wheeled them to the opera house. And once again, when Piccolino played the piano, the plants seemed to brighten. This called for an even bigger experiment. With growing excitement, father and son pushed through the fog, knocking on doors and begging friends and neighbors to donate their sickly plants to an important cause. In time, the opera house was so filled with foliage that it began to look more like a garden than a theater. And now the maestro joined his son at the piano and together they played a lively air. But with so many poorly plants, one piano duet didn't seem enough to help them all. And Piccolino and his father suddenly knew what 
to do. And I think that's as far as we're going to go and tease you a little bit to read the rest <laughs> of the book <laughs> to find out what happens next. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, people can buy the book from the link in the chat box. Um, but we do have about a dozen questions. So I will stop with my questions there. Thank you so much for humoring me. And Thank you so much. Pleasure. Like my pleasure. All right, let's jump into our audience questions. Um, okay, so this is a question from um, Ali and her daughter, Olivia from New Jersey would like to know, what is your favorite part of being an author? I don't know who wants to take that first. I think the, there is a joy in the creative aspect, but I think for me, obviously, when it all comes together, like a small production in theater or something like that, when it comes together, the joy of seeing what the illustrators contributed, what the end words, papers look like. Yeah, well, the, by the way, the can quality we of those the papers. Papers? Yeah, can sure. I hold that up? We are, it was the last thing that came into the book was was the very end papers, which is what you, when you open a book, is the first thing you see. And I must say, these are gorgeous end papers. Wait a minute, I'm not getting that it. straight. Yeah. 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 Gorgeous. And we were so delighted with them, weren't we? Yeah, we were. Yeah. It is, it is such a thrill, I think, uh, when the art starts to come in, because you've worked so hard on getting the right words in the right order and making sure the story mm -hmm. is although is actually it was never doing, completely never satisfied always it. always thinking oh if we could only go back and change that one thing but but when the illustrator it comes on board and adds their contribution generally it advances the story beyond what we could have even imagined like we have mm. we think visually when we're writing and we have a sort of an image in our minds but time and time again we are blown away by how an illustrator sees something and then adds to it and, and then we ha we can cut a little bit because if it's shown in the uh, illustration then you don't need to describe it as much right no. we don't want to write what the art will show you know so magical that's, that's thrilling i think it's a little bit like a small production of any kind coming to life. And that's the joy. I love that. Thank you. The next question is from Joanna Van Zeller and she says, hi, I am a teacher who's giving a talk this evening to parents about encouraging children to write and supporting yes. children with writing. What advice would you give? That's a great question. Great question. Mm. So um, I would give, I, because I teach writing and I teach writing to children quite often yes, uh, at, the, at the high school and middle school level, I would say, uh, I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, if you really want to encourage your kids to write, let them let them take the lead. Let them write about what they want to write about. Let them write in their own and voices. And don't worry about that. Be things. less concerned with grammar and punctuation. I mean, obviously, there's an important place for that, in, in particularly in the classroom. But at the early stages, say yes to everything. And, mm. um, and just let their imaginations go roam free and let their voices come forward and celebrate that. Because they will grow. And grow. they will grow yeah. and they'll learn the rest eventually. But you want to you want to underscore the joy of writing. Mm. Um, and the best way to do that is to say yes to everything at the beginning. Right. And then um, and then help them understand because, you know, kids like like adults. Uh, are impatient and you know we we write a first draft and we want it to be finished and, um, but, and it kids never too, but, but it's all about rewriting so um, help them understand that a first draft is just that and that they have lots and lots of opportunity to keep changing or words find one find word that is even better than that word I don't know when that kind of guidance might come in or when they'll learn it but well they learn revision very early on that yeah, it's all about rewriting yeah, you yeah, find that so, yeah. yeah practice absolutely yeah. uh the next question is from daisy marie murphy and she asks what inspires your themes and characters it could be virtually anything i mean the the kind of things that uh, have come across our paths um i uh Oh gosh, darling. Well, well, each one is a different, you know, in this case it was an image hmm. uh, that we that we, that captured our imagination. And the very first we wrote was, read around was did I have anything for very, very small children, especially boys? And that was that was inspired completely by my son, who was a truck lover, and we were having yeah. trouble. I would read about nothing else, else would yeah. you? <laughs> um, our very fairy princess series was inspired by my daughter, who was indeed a very fairy princess. Very, very princess, princess yes. every, uh, but th then we've done middle grade novels like um, 
I think, is that a young a a little red, red dragon? Yeah, dragon that was a wonderful mm. example. Mm. I was looking up something else in a book and I became aware of a word and what, um, no, no, you found a, the, the, that the, yeah, the chien I was looking for another word and I came across a French word called Mon Montagerie Dog of in this book. Mm. And I thought it, it was a, um, a encyclopedia of some kind. And I thought, what on earth is that? There were just two lines and the dog of Montagerie was a fable a long time ago, a legend, a legend really. And uh, he witnessed the um, killing of his master and he alone knew who had killed him. And mm. I, that's all they said, nothing else as to what was the situation, how did it come about, why was he killed? So, so the answer mm. is it could be an image, it could be seeing an entry in an encyclopedia. It could be something from our own lives, from our, one of our own family too. members. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the, the dog um, of Montessori, where was I going with this? Um, oh, we, we figured out, I learned, that's what I'm trying to say. I learned, uh, we both did so much of it. This is set in medieval times, early Middle Ages. And so to learn about what the armor was like, what people ate in early French, uh, um, days of uh, and uh, I just learned so much about so many things. It was it became a great it's thrilling experience mm. and a really great thrill. I think we tend to we tend to lean towards ideas that are either about things about which we're passionate, um, yeah. you know, the arts, nature, those kinds of things, mm. or things about which we're curious and we want to know more and we want to try and understand what how I might think we that learn as much as. Yeah, because we love to learn ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The research and the curiosity is so important. Yeah. Okay, let's see. The next question is from Suzanne Loprieto, and she says, Hi, I'm here with my daughter, Elise. Hi, Elise, who is a huge fan of Julie Andrews. She would like to know what you enjoy more, acting or being an author, if that's even possible to answer. Yeah, it's virtually impossible. <laughs> They're not that far mm. apart. Um, I think these days, particularly, um, I love being an author. I'm learning all the time because from, although I loved to write as a child also, um, I didn't really get down to writing until the early 70s, did I, darling? Oh, right. Yeah, so, um, but, but it also, writing, I don't have to get into hair and makeup every day, so <laughs> <laughs> it's much easier. You don't have to travel. No. <laughs> no, I don't have to travel. And we can be together. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. These days, certainly um, giving people pleasure, if possible, is the thing that turns me on the most. It took a long time to learn that I wasn't just doing things by rote, that, that uh, I could sing. I'm blessed with, I was blessed with that. But, but eventually I discovered that I could take people's minds off their own problems, their own homes for a few hours in the theater or in a film. And... Then I began the giving, and that made all the difference. And it's a learning growth, really. I love that. Um, there are so many thank yous and accolades. I'm not going to get to everything. I am trying to concentrate on a kid's question. So um, this is from Jane Kelly, and she writes, Good evening from North Carolina from me and my mom. Where do you all like to be when you write? At a desk, outside, or wherever? Where is your favorite place to write? Uh, usually at the dining room table. <laughs> because yeah. we can spread uh, yeah this is my office and it's far too small yeah we're here in mom's office but um she's got a, a really nice long dining room table and that's that tends to be where we are there's good light uh we can be surrounded and by best our dogs. ages isn't it yeah yeah we're close to the tea kettle you know all of those important, important things yes absolutely uh, the next question is from Anna Kilgore, and she says, hi, Julie and Emma. As a music lover, what do you want people to take away from this book about the magic of music? And do you have a favorite instrument? Oh, <laughs> another great question. Well, we very much hope that readers will take away a renewed appreciation for the power of music um, or a renewed curiosity about music. Um, that's that's something that that's I think one of the really wishes. hope. And the yeah. other wish, of course, mm -hmm. is what matters most to the reader because right but she's asking about music specifically yeah. in this book and so what would you say your favorite instrument is 
depends on what piece I'm listening to. I think mm. I love, of course, the violin, which is hugely difficult to play. But if I you had think, to listen to one instrument, I think probably piano, mm. because my mother was a pianist. Yeah, and a fine one actually. She was very. So very I good. love classical guitar too. You, yes, I do. Well, yeah. I mean, once you start that, then there are flutes, yeah, you know, know. and. Uh, <laughs> French horns and trumpets, and I love fanfares. I love it when the trumpets are sounding out the arrival of Her Majesty the Queen or something mm -hmm. like that. It's very mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. So it's the combination of them all and when they come together and the great, great composers that I love so much. Mostly classical. Mm -hmm. Although I do love and came to love because of my own children, mm -hmm. the Beatles and all the, I mean, today it's another group altogether. But it is so, the Patch Brothers. Yes, it? it is the Patch yeah. Brothers, yeah, that kind of thing. Jazz I love and appreciate, but oh. ultimately classical. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question from an anonymous attendee that writes, my parents bought standing room tickets to one of your performances in Camelot when the op this writer was nine. And oh. then she has been, he or she's been enchanted by it ever since. They are wondering, did T.H. White's book inspire your own adventures in writing in any way? What a great question. That is a great question. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough many years to go to meet him. Um, uh, and it was, he was the most amazing gentleman. He was the writer of The Once and Future King, which is that great mm -hmm. book of four novels in one volume, eventually. Uh, and about the, about the Arthurian legends, the, yeah, the Knights uh, of the Round Which, what, which yeah. Camelot, of course, and I can't talk about. The, the, well, you can, because Camelot is theater. So oh, okay, we can. Yeah. So Camelot was taken and based on this vast book of four novels by T.H. White, Terence Hanbury White, wasn't yes. he? But he was a wonderful character. And That's actually, another book you read to me when I was a kid. Was the was the Once and Future King? And there are quotes from that book that are just yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, the thing for being bored, said Merlin, is to, to learn, learn something. something. Yeah, learn how the world wags and what wags it, you know. And I remember reading that too. I think, I think to the question, <laughs> yes. I mean, we, that is a favorite book of ours. But actually, but in terms of Tim and T.H. White, we actually uh, uh, went to see him and he lives on an island off the coast of Cherbourg, France, an English <laughs> island called Alderney, and it's become a great holiday. But, in, but yeah. in terms of it informing your writing. Yes, of course it did, because he was such a superb writer. I mean, it always makes you ashamed to even try writing when it's <laughs> as great as that, but it's a wonderful set of books. And and doing Camelot, which was based on that, it was, he came over to see it. And of course, somehow, somewhere, he influenced all of it, yeah. Mm, nice. Um, there's a question from Chloe Carson. Chloe writes, uh, as I'm sitting here with my mom, taking care of her as she's healing, I wanted to ask, and you've touched on this a little bit, but Chloe specifically asks, what is your favorite thing specifically about working together creatively as mom and daughter? And oh, I know you're going to give the answer to yeah. that one. <laughs> um, so this was the happy surprise of working together. One of the things that we didn't expect, but that has become such a great value of our creative life together is that when we are working creatively together, there isn't time or space or energy for anything negative to, to kind of interfere. So, so mm -hmm. we're not talking about our aches and pains. We're not complaining about our, you know, about politics or the weather or, or other, family or other family members or anything. Mm -hmm. And we're not bickering as mom, mother and daughter sometimes do. Yeah. Just do we bicker? Well, <laughs> Oh, I can't imagine. People like everybody yeah. else. But, um, but what we're doing is we're both concentrating on a common creative problem to solve. Yeah. And it just takes the pressure off of everything else and gives us. And you can get lost in that world too. Yeah. So that, and that's pleasure. just such a, a wonderful joy. It mm -hmm. really is. As you can in a good book, uh, yeah. any good book, any great book. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of joyful, it is so beautiful to see the two of you together. It just, you, you have such beautiful affection for each other. It's really such a pleasure for all of us oh, to, Heidi, to thank you. questions. Um, there is a question from an audience member named Amber Cheney. And Amber says, are, we're asking, are you planning to make an audio book for this as well, or any of your kids' books? I am very much an audio learner as well as with your memoir, which are fantastic. I comprehend them better if I'm able to see and hear them. Yes. Yes, we are. We, uh, we actually have been having uh, 
discussions about that. And that is very much in the future plans for this book. And uh, um, for many of our books, we've yeah. added music, like adding a CD in the back of a book occasionally. Right, but, but specifically an audio This book one will happen. Will, will yes. happen. Yeah. Yeah. We're Thank just, you for asking. Just, and we hope just talking about it. Yes. Yeah, we hope you'll enjoy listening. Great. Yeah, keep your eye open for that. Uh, Victoria asks, what has been the most surprising part of being an author? And this is Victoria from Malta. Thank you. Has there been a surprising thing? I think for me, the most surprising part is sometimes when you've written something you go back to it at a later date and you don't remember where it came from or how you wrote yes it. that's mm. very um, and mm. it seems like it's some it has some kind of creative energy all of its own like it has its own or that um, we were visited by a muse yes exactly uh, something yeah. like that and and it's fascinating we we go back and we reread things and we think did we write that yeah. I don't remember that. <laughs> quite often we go back and say god how could we have written that yeah, that's true. <laughs> but truly the satisfaction is in the doing yeah. yeah but other some very mundane surprising things um for us picture books specific um it was surprising to us to learn that um, authors who are not also illustrators don't typically aren't typically allowed to communicate directly with the illustrator. Right. So the decision, the choice of illustrator is generally governed by the publisher mm -hmm. themselves oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and the communication between authors and illustrator, if any, mm. is always mediated by the editor and the art director. And mm. so that's to protect the autonomy of both creative, all, well, in this case, all three yeah. creative entities. But we're not that happy with that huh we would much prefer to mm -hmm. we'd love to be able to to be more directly involved but but mm -hmm. i but we get it and we respect it and and, and we do get and in some cases very involved with the like mm -hmm. the fairy fairy princess too yeah depends on how how open the the illustrators some illustrators are more open to feedback than others yeah right. yeah i think a lot of people that are, aren't familiar with the book world don't know that so i think that's yeah. really interesting. It's really quite interesting. Interesting. Yeah. awesome we ask a number of changes. My poor dad, when he, because he did illustrate some of our books and he, yeah. he managed him like crazy. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God, he's in mind. <laughs> yeah, very, very <laughs> yeah. And then we had one wonderful uh, illustrator who said, I will do 12 finished paintings and I don't repaint. But he became oh. a great friend eventually. Yeah. 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 And he was. He but was we hard. had to take what he gave us and thank mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. it was superb. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Good. Uh, Erwin Franz is asking, what song did Piccolino play on the piano uh, while his father was sweeping the oh, stage? Oh, what a good question. It's from his son, Liam. That's from his son, Liam. Well, I would ask Liam, what song do you think he played? <laughs> that's piano. a good question. That's the, uh, can he tell us that? Yeah, that's, think? that's the question we would love for, for people to but, ask themselves. And, to and while you're thinking about that, Liam, I think that it would have been something Classical, but small and simple, because of course yeah. his father was the great conductor of the orchestra, as well as being kind enough to look after the opera house when it was empty. But I think it would have been something, a beautiful air, a simple classical air that he, father would have taught the son, something like that. Something that but he did could we, play did we have an simple. answer from the, him at all? Did he? I don't, let's see, I'll see if there's, I don't see anything right now. I'll keep my oh. eye open. If you come across it, you'll get back to it. Okay, that sounds good. Um, let's see, I did have, a, oh, this was from Anonymous, but I'm curious your answer to this. Is the creative method similar when you begin to learn a new song and beginning to write a story? That was interesting. That's one for you. Yeah, I love finding out what the song means. Mm. I love um, I can't sing a song without a good, um, without great lyrics, without great words. Uh, I don't mean to sound um, uh, snooty about that. It's just that for me, the words matter most. And um, I always try to find my way into a song by what do the words tell me and say, and what pictures can I conjure? And it takes quite a while to figure all that out. Um, I guess the difference is that when you're learning a song, you are interpreting somebody else's and also, ideas yes. and words mm -hmm. and writing, mm -hmm. you are trying to translate your own. Mm -hmm. But it is a very interesting uh, thought. And <clears throat> a lot of young singers don't concentrate on the words, they concentrate on the melody, which is mm -hmm. what I did when I was very young. And it is something that you eventually learn is 
terribly important, of course. Mm. What are you communicating to the audience? And uh, so for me, the words matter very much in a song, and I love singing a song. But it is telling, they're both ways of telling a story. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, the next question is from Jan Gallion, and Jan wants to know, what are your plans for your next book, if you can talk about it? Oh, we can, as a matter of Good. fact. Good, um, great. We do have another book in the pipeline. It's coming out in April. It's called Waiting in the Wings. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's another book celebrating the arts, a little quite different from this one. Very different. Um, and uh, this particular one is loosely based um, on a, a true event that happened um, at uh, Bay Street Theater, which is a theater near where we live that my husband and I built and, um, and founded. And, yeah. founded. and uh, there was a family of ducks who Ooh. nested in the planter box um, in the theater courtyard one year. <gasps> That's the beginning of the story. Oh, and I love it. <laughs> but it had the sweetest ending and, and yeah. everybody contributed to that ending that was in, in the, the real in the real life, in event. The real life yeah. event. So that so what we we took that idea and we sort of let our imaginations run. Fleshed it out yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's gonna be uh, another wonderful illustrator too. Illustrated yeah. by uh, E.G. Keller and um, it's it's really he's done a beautiful job. Yeah, it, oh, yeah. it's it's such a joy. Actually. The, the pandemic was, in a, in a funny way, allowed us to write quite a number. Yeah, we actually wrote three picture books during, oh, during COVID. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we had one because we out. had more time uh, to, and right. had to stay home and be careful. We wrote, um, we wrote a, last uh, fall a picture book called The First Notes, the story mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. That's, so that's great. The, yeah, the history of how the, the solfege came to be. And we are also working on the third installment in mom's memoirs which is so, taking forever yeah isn't it? Um, yeah so we've just gotten another That's extension a big, on big <laughs> project so yeah. we're Thank you so so saying happy, that. happily diverted by these these lovely joyous books, books yeah Good. Thank you for mentioning that. There was a question that someone was wondering about that. Um, th I love this question. Sarah Hobson is asking, well, she's saying, hello, huge fans of both of you. What do you both do to celebrate having finished a book together? <laughs> a huge sigh of relief. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You Ritual. <laughs> Sometimes we'll go out to dinner and raise a glass to... to... Yes. I think if it's a... Uh, Emma has helped me. I've written two memoirs and we're on the third one and when those are completed it is a sigh of relief it's a long long process to go over my own life and try to write about it interestingly and not offend anybody but write truthfully right. and when that's done it's interesting you know it we don't really think of you know when is a book done is the question ever really and, yeah. you know it isn't done when we send it into our editor, because our editor is then going to send back notes and we're going to do a revision, it isn't done when it goes to the illustrator, because once we see the illustrations, we're going to make changes to accommodate those. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it's all until we're actually holding the finished book in, in our hands and it's pub day like today. Um, you know, this is really our celebration is being able to share it with the world. Mm -hmm. it goes out to a waiting world and we hope they like it. That's the next thing. Really. Yes. I think everyone is going to love this book. Um, Patricia asks, what was your favorite role in a play? I saw you when I was nine years old when my parents took me to the theater in London to see you in My Fair Lady, which was so inspiring. Can, can you answer that one? Did you have a favorite role? Every, everything I've done has been so different. Mm. And so I've loved things for different reasons. My Fair Lady was probably the one of the hardest because it is one of the more difficult theater musicals that it has George Bernard Shaw's or Bernard Shaw's um, great, great uh, uh, book, uh, play to, to as, as its foundation. But, and then the music and then the dramatic acting and then the playing a Cockney girl and learning how to speak properly and- A lot of screaming. A lot of screaming, yeah. <laughs> a lot of pure singing as well, which was very hard on, on the voice vocally. But, but mm. on the vocal situation. But then Camelot was such a joy because it was very beautiful, uh, written by the same people that wrote My Fair Lady, Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe. Oh, gosh. Um, well, and films, of course, they're each one of them are different and not all of them are musicals. I think it's people as much as 
the pieces in a way who did I love working with and so on right so, which probably is also a very hard question but you know what you know, the truthful answer is every single one of them has been a learning curve for me it's mm. not that you just get up and do them and they're you know you're able to you sweat it out and you feel insecure and you're never sure and keeping it going night after night in the theaters is, is very difficult and certainly with two shows on a matinee day uh, twice a week it's you know hard work. very hard work yes no well, thank you for sharing that that's really special for us to know um, there is a question from Mira Mortada, and she asks, how does your creativity translate in different areas, such as writing, acting, and singing? It's kind of a, a general question, but yeah, how, how do you express your creativity through these different Let's venues? Let's say one thing right away. I don't yeah. think you've ever had such a bunch of really original, wonderful questions. <laughs> they yeah. are great. They are yeah, completely really fresh, great. yeah. And Thank how you. does, what was the question how again? How your creativity translate from writing to acting to singing to well for me i think I, I guess maybe the way of thinking about it is is there is there a common thread well i think uh, when we're writing i personally see the the piece as either a, a film or a, a play of some kind in other words for, for going back to dragon the the book about this special dog i envisaged what if it was a film I could see the screen and the panning across of a wonderful pastoral countryside and so on and what would that music be like and so on so I was able to write it from that point of view and I guess all the lovely music that I've heard had a lot to play in in that way it was a very simple little opening but uh, I remember thinking if this was a film how would I want to see it and then I was able to write it and I think that's the way all the things come together. I don't know how you I, feel. I guess about. I, what I would say is I think they are, everything is a, a different way of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all storytelling. Yeah. Singing, playing, yes. and, um, and, and so in the end, it's all about what am I trying to say? What is the point I'm trying to make? What am I trying to get across? How will it? How, what do I want somebody to think about mm. when they hear this or read this or see this? Yeah. You know, what, what questions? But have your... Um, different, different um, uh, uh, endeavors, disciplines, yeah, disciplines, absolutely yeah. Each other. I remember, it in. Um, you know, I teach uh, or I have for many years taught playwriting to children, to, mm -hmm. to young children in schools. And when mom and I, quite often, when mom and I were working on a particular book, I would come home from teaching a playwriting class in um, a school mm. and I'd say, I, I know what's wrong with the second act. I've figured it out. We, yeah. have, we, you know, we need to do this, this, and this. And, you know, so they do inform each other. Right? And this, this is a very uh, tricky thing to say, but there's nothing better than a bathroom break once in a while. That's true. Because the minute <laughs> you go make a cup of tea or take a bathroom break, yes. it's like we come back and say, I got it. Good advice. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Showers. Yeah. 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 Chance for a rest or fly off somewhere else. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many times that happens. I love that. <laughs> I, we have time. There's so many questions, but I think we just have time for maybe one question and then a final comment. But uh, Ginny Grigg says, um, Julie, you have had a full life as an actress, wife, mother, author. So what haven't you done but still want to do? Oh, I'd love mm. so many things I would love to still learn uh, a language or I'd love to learn more about um, geology or mm. you know, astronomy, uh, the stars or anything. And um, what haven't I? And I'd like to travel a little more, though that's difficult these days. Um, uh, difficult because of all the different uh, COVID and whatever. But there's a ton of stuff I'd love to do, and I hope we write a few more books together because that is a pleasure. And you can go anywhere when you write a book. Yes, the beauty of books and storytelling. Yeah. Um, I'm going to end on this last comment because it just feels so perfect. Um, it's from Gabriella, and she says, I'd like to say thank you to Miss Julie. She's been a major part of my whole life, and I'm so grateful she's continuing to share her numerous talents with all of us. I can't think of ending on a better note than that. Thank you, and thank you all. And fabulous questions. They were amazing they questions. Really, yeah. Such good questions. Really, really 
making us both delve a little deeper and think yeah, harder. It's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely um, to be able to answer such thoughtful questions. Yeah, and you really made me certainly. I don't know about you. I had to think a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank, well, you, thank you to our audience. It's yeah, been a wonderful, to wonderful help to get us through. And we love all those plants behind you. And oh yes, yes you. my in your honor. I do. Yeah. I bring yeah. all my yeah. house plants. Yes, yeah. perfect. <laughs> Good oh, so pretty. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, your book is beautiful. It is something that everyone is going to want in their libraries and to read to the kids in their lives. So please take a look at the chat box. There's a link there for the books, and we do have some uh, book plates coming. So I encourage everyone to get books for everyone in their lives. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you for celebrating your book birthday with us. We are so happy that you are here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you so much.